There is no one size fits all pet food, whether you're feeding your dog or you're feeding your cat, really any other pet, but dogs and cats are all I really know about. So that's what we're talking about (laughs) on the Pet Parenting Reset is feeding our dogs and our cats. And there is no one size fits all solution. I feed my pet in a way that works for her and your dog may need something totally different. And that's why I'm always on the lookout for different foods, different brands, different companies that are doing things a little bit differently that still line up with the values that I have for how we should be feeding our animals, but in a broader sense of the term, not in a strict, this works for my animal kind of way. That's why I'm so excited to bring you today's guest. Hannah Mandelbaum from Evermore Pet Food is joining us today to talk about their cooked pet food that is formulated with pretty much all whole foods with just a little bit of zinc added into a couple of the recipes to help round it out. But for the most part, everything is made with whole foods. That's where all of the nutrients are coming from. I'm going to let her tell you about it because it is a lot more complex than I can put into this quick intro, but I am, I'm just so excited to be able to bring you this information because again, there is no one size fits all. And even a dog who is fed a raw food diet their entire life, like my dog, if they get sick or maybe as they approach their senior years, you may want to feed them a little bit differently because their body may respond differently to a cooked food versus a raw food and sometimes vice versa. So I want to be able to provide you with as much information as possible to make the best decisions for your individual pet. So we're going to be talking about Evermore Pet Food today. And one thing that Hannah did tell me after we stopped recording, and I promised her I would include it in the opening of the Uh, podcast is that Evermore Pet Food does provide consultations. So if you have questions about their food or how to transition to their food, uh, please go to evermorepetfood.com and you can fill out their form to have a consultation with their care team. So without any further ado, let's get into today's episode with Hana from Evermore Pet Food. Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. Hannah, thank you so much for being here with me today. I am so interested in uh, Evermore uh, Pet Food because I have been a raw feeder for quite some time, but I also understand that raw food is not for every dog and is not for necessarily every life stage. So even if you have a dog that is raw fed, when they get older, a lot of times we may not they may not do as well on it. So there's various reasons to have like an array of different foods that we are comfortable with feeding and know about and, you know, like the product, like the brand. I very much am into not just small business, but women owned businesses and just having that like transparency that you get with smaller businesses I, I love, that's my, that's my thing. So I'm so happy you're here to talk about Evermore Pet Food. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me. So let's start, I guess let's start at the beginning. Why, why did you create a pet food company? Oh God. Well, that is, that is a story. Uh, me and my business partner, Allison, we didn't set out to start a pet food company, actually. So I used to be a dog walker in Brooklyn, and my now business partner, Allison, was a health supportive personal chef. And she was actually one of my dog walking clients. And that seems interesting enough, right? Dog walker, chef, get together, start a dog food company. But that's not actually the story. Another one of my dog walking clients was this sort of 
loner, eccentric woman named Mia, who had what I like to call an underground dog food company that she started after 9-11. She had lived in Tribeca. And for all of the non-New Yorkers out here listening, that was the neighborhood adjacent to world, where the World Trade Center was. Wow. So after 9-11... Ooh. After 9-11, um, her dog got diagnosed with cancer. A lot of the dogs in the neighborhood did. If you think about it, like people are getting diagnosed with cancer now and for the past several years, but the dogs, they're much smaller, much more sensitive. So there was a dog cancer cluster. He was given a six-month prognosis. So she did everything she could to learn about like, okay, how can I support this dog? How can I extend his life? I love him so much. And she landed on cooking as one of the things that she could do. She worked with a holistic vet to develop a recipe, and he lived for another six years. In the meantime, she started cooking for like basically all the dogs in the neighborhood. So anyway, she gets priced out, ends up moving to my neighborhood in Brooklyn, and I become her dog walker. And I learn about the company a little bit, you know, over, over the time that I'm working for her. One day she calls me and she's actually in the middle of having a stroke, which is like, yeah, it's like, call 911. Don't call your dog walker, call 911. But I was the first person she called. Um, at any rate, I stepped in to help. It was a minor stroke. She was supposed to, you know, be out, back on her feet in a couple of weeks. And Allison, actually, she was kind of moving back to New York from, um, she'd worked at a summer camp, converting things off of Cisco to fresh, naturally, you know, locally sourced natural foods. And she sort of didn't have a place to stay for a little while. So we, she basically sublet me as apartment. And the idea was we were going to help out, do these small batch recipes until Mia was back on her feet. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. Um, Mia ended up having another stroke in the hospital and was rendered unable to um, to speak and unable to move. Um, so we end up being in this um, long-term volunteer situation, basically. And during this time, Allison was feeding her dog Connor the food and Connor was a raw fed dog and had been fed raw for, you know, pretty much his entire life. Allison also cooked for him sometimes. The dog never had a bad meal. Connor started thriving like never before. His he slimmed down, his coat was getting shiny, and he was a German shepherd mix, so like his stools were never like a hundred percent. And as we like to talk about poop, his poop was perfect. So we really believed that there was something here. So, you know, we basically had a state of the union with Mia and we're like, look, we can carry this on, but we're kind of going to need to start the company over because, you know, just from the standpoint of having a functional business that actually does things with <laughs> registering with the Department of Agriculture, paying taxes, you know, all that good stuff. So anyway, we, we, did everything we needed to do to get a food legally sold, um, consulted with a lot of very smart people and did a lot of lab testing to make sure that everything was as it should be. And um, Mia actually ended up passing away um, nine months after her stroke. And um, yeah, here we are uh, 14 years later. So that is the story. And it's... um. It's sort of like an intense place to have started a company, but we really feel in a lot of ways that it was almost divine intervention, like it was meant to be. Yeah, that is very intense. Oh my goodness. And I just cannot imagine, I, that would be me. I would be the one that's like, I just got in a horrific car accident and I'm calling my pet set, <laughs> go check on my animal. <laughs> that would be me. Yeah, I, it, was, it was, I actually, um... Uh, Books, her dog at the time, which wasn't the original dog from from nine eleven. This was like a lot later on. It was eight years later. But um, I actually ended up getting him rehomed as well, and um, so he he was put in a very good situation with a woman that actually shared his birthday. <laughs> so it was oh, wow. that also that also strangely felt like it was meant to be. Yeah. So yeah, and it's interesting um, that you say that 
your partner's dog went from being raw fed to cooked food and really thrived because I, you know, I've, I've been a raw feeder for, I guess a little more than 10 years now. And I mean, my dog is doing wonderfully, don't get me wrong, but the more I learn, so, you know, becoming a certified holistic pet health coach, being certified in canine nutrition, like the more I learn, the more my mind opens up to the idea that there isn't a one size fits all for every dog, or like I said earlier, even for every life stage of a dog, if they're ill, if they're at the end, you know, closer to end of life, senior dogs often will do better on, on a a diet that is cooked. So like kind of like a almost pre-digested state. Right. Um, and then the quality of the ingredients that we use matters so much because so many dogs that are raw fed, especially our, you know, like our DIY raw feeders, just to make it work, to make it economical, are buying just regular grocery store meats, which I mean, is fine. You know, this is what we eat. (laughs) Understandably, generally, this is what we eat. But when we can actually source foods that are of the highest quality. So I, I, I'd like if you if you would to talk a little bit about the quality aspect of Evermore, because that's what really drew me in, especially with like I'm looking at the beef going, this is not just grass fed. This is also grass finished. That's hard to, I mean, for me, I live in the middle of cattle country in Texas and I have a hard time finding <laughs> grass fed and grass finished beef. So like, yeah. And it makes a huge difference, Be, you know, being a nutritionist. I understand the profile of the nutrients in a grain-fed cow versus a grass-fed cow are totally different. So we're really – not only are you providing, like, a high-quality food in itself, but, like, the actual ingredients are of the highest quality. Could you talk about that a little bit? Sure, absolutely. And I want to preface this with no matter what you're feeding, um, if you're even listening to this podcast, if you're feeding anything fresh, um, you're doing great. So yeah. just want to, just want to preface that. I don't want to make sure. anyone feel I don't want to make anyone feel bad about what they're doing. But yeah, so with Evermore, we and I say guiding principle first is animal welfare. Number one, we love animals. We respect animals and it's not just our pets. It's the farmed animals that go into our food, right? So the first thing that we consider when we're sourcing our ingredients is what sort of life is this animal leading before, you know, that day when it's slaughtered um, for food and even, and that day, like what is, what is that animal's experience like? Um, So, you know, for our poultry we're actually this is really exciting right now we're gap global animal partnership certified we use free range poultry our chicken we're going pastured on and that's i mean we started we started using fully pastured chicken this month so that's really exciting we use for our beef and our lamb we use um, 100% grass fed as you mentioned regeneratively raised so that's meat that's um that's animals that are raised in a way that not only doesn't harm the environment, but is beneficial to it. And that's like a whole topic. But but basically, when when these ruminants are moved around as if they were kind of natural roaming herbivores that don't really exist in this country anymore, um, roaming free, um, it, it, it behaves in concert with the soil in such a way that it helps regenerate our environment. So that's regenerative, right? We really prioritize that. With the eggs that go in our food, those are from pasture chickens. So all of these things that are about honoring the way that the animals are supposed to live, as you mentioned, they improve the nutritional quality of the food, right? So that's the first thing we do. We, we really look at our protein sources and choose them for the welfare aspect, but also for the nutrition aspect, right? These are, these are foods that are, that are packed with more vitamins and minerals and better omega ratios. So that's That's the first part. And then when we're looking at our other ingredients, so we have basically all of our produce is certified organic. We use a lot of leafy greens. We use things like apples. We use these amazing ingredients that when they're raised conventionally, 
can have a very high pesticide load. Like everyone, everyone talks about glyphosate a lot these days. I'm going to get to that, but that is not even close to the only pesticide that's used, right? There are so many substances that go on to the, the produce that we, especially leafy greens, especially apples, you know, these, these fruits and vegetables that are so great for animals. Um, if you, you, you want that to be clean, if you're adding toxins, you know, it's sort of, it's sort of countering some of, some of the benefits that these are providing. So all of our produce is certified organic. Then we do use a small amount of oats and barley in our um, in our beef and chicken recipes. Those are also 100% certified organic. The fish oil that we use is MSC certified, you know, wild Alaskan pollock oil. And then this is the hot, I'm writing a whole blog on this because this, this is the hot topic right now. But we use a little bit of safflower oil, right? And seed oils have an extremely bad rep right now. Um, the safflower oil that we use, it's... Um, it's organic, first of all, it's certified organic, which means it's expeller pressed. So there's no chemicals used in that process. And we target a high linoleic safflower oil. So you'll see seed oils in a lot of pet foods and people are like, why are they there? They're there for linoleic acid, um, which is a really hard nutrient to meet naturally. But and you have all these accounts like seed oil, seed oil, seed oils. We actually got dinged in more than one pet food review for organic seed oil. So I'm getting very passionate about this topic. Um, but as with any ingredient, you know, you've got to look at quality. You have to look at purpose and you have to look at context, right? So there's like an industrial canola oil that's in like the deep fryer at a restaurant, right? That's very different from the organic safflower oil that's used in small amounts in, you know, natural dog food. So I think the point I'm trying to make here is we have this super wide range of high quality ingredients. Each one is chosen for a very specific reason in our formula to target very specific nutrients. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you, you brought that. There are actually two things that I did want to bring up. <laughs> <laughs> on the ingredients <laughs> panel. Um, and I'm glad you, you actually brought both of them up because I, I know that there isn't a car, like a, a carbohydrate requirement for dogs. However, that doesn't mean that there is never a use for grain. In fact, like there are, like in TCVM, there are uses for every food. And so there, like, there could be, even if we're talking about, like, uh, you know, food energetics or food therapy as, like, an alternative to, to medicine, there, there are lots of different ways in which we can view different food items, even the ones that a lot of us have this, like, really negative association <laughs> with. And that was, like, my, I, my big, when I, when I, got the packages and I was about to feed it to my dog. I'm like, I have never fed. I've had my, my dog is 10 years, just turned 10 years old. I've never since the day I adopted her, fed her a grain. <laughs> <laughs> so how'd she, how'd she do with it? How'd she do with it? She's doing, she's doing okay. I, I mean, she's only been eating it for a couple of days and it, and it's not like at the top of the ingredient list, right? Like it's, it's no, it's a 4%. The organic oats and the organic barley are 4% of the, uh, the entire formula um, combined. So it's, it, I'm glad you brought up that the dogs have no need for carbohydrates, right? Everyone says that in relationship to greens. I have, I have two responses to that. First of all, yeah. people are recommending that dogs eat apples, that they eat pumpkins, that they eat all kinds of, of produce. Um, those have carbohydrates, right? So that's the yeah. first piece of it. Yeah. And that, that, so that's, that's one part of it. Then, then there are things like, okay, the dogs don't have a natural requirement for them, but do they, they don't have a natural requirement for the like anthocyanins and blueberries. They don't have a natural requirement for the quercetin and apples. So I think that that's language that people use to single out this aspect of grains because right grains are a filler a lot of the time yeah. um you know and that's i get it that's we want to kind of like kind of separate that but if you look at the grains that we're using the organic oats and barley there's a couple of reasons we use them first of all they are a great source of nutrients that are hard to get naturally like manganese right manganese is very hard to get naturally and another piece of it especially with the ones that we use um I think your audience probably knows about beta glucans, right? 
Um, yeah. that amazing, amazing substance in mushrooms. There are also beta-glucans in oats and barley. In fact, mm -hmm. they're one of the best sources of them. And okay, like why not just feed mushrooms instead, right? There's, there's, there are different forms of beta-glucans and the beta-glucans mm -hmm. in oats and barley actually, they function as a prebiotic, right? And, um, and the other ones don't. The other thing about it is that they're soluble fiber, right? So one of the reasons people come to us forevermore is that their dog's having gut issues, that they're having digestive issues, that they're having reflux. And I cannot overstate how much better these dogs do on our grain inclusive formulas than our grain free ones for the most part. So everything has its place. And I think, again, this comes back to that idea of quality, purpose, and context, right? If you are if you have like this conventional grain that's been sprayed with glyphosate to, you know, to dry it out, and you're, it's more than like, more than like 50% of your formula, right? So the, the quality there is low. The, the context there is it's at the front of an ingredient list and the purpose is that it's a filler, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas our organic grains, right? There's organic quality, that quality is high. It's at the bottom of our ingredient list and it's to provide targeted nutrition and these very, you know, this, this soluble fiber and these beta glucans. So it's a, it's a very, whenever you're assessing ingredients, you really have to step back and say, okay, why is this here? Yeah. Well, and that's why I think it's such an important conversation to have because Certainly, there are going to be people who would, people I know at least, that <laughs> would look at the ingredient label and go, no, thank you. But, like, there's a reason, like you were saying, there is a reason and there are, there are um, nutrients, there, there are purposes other than, other than filler that, that we can look at for, and, and the fact that they are certified organic makes a huge difference as well. And I'm going to go off on a little tangent here and hopefully you follow me. <laughs> so oh, I, I'm good at creating tangents. So I'm happy to, I'm happy to follow you on yours. <laughs> so I'm just starting to look into this. I, I recently found Gary Brecca and he is a human biologist, physio biologist, I think. Phys anyway. So <laughs> he just studies research and studies the human body. So he has been talking about, it's not because we are, so, and, and you, you were touching on this a minute ago, which, which reminded me, we are so obsessed with glyphosate and we should be. It's, it's not good for us. It's not good for the soil. It's not good for our animal. It's not good. It's, <laughs> for, oh, it's bad. It's bad. I think we can bad. agree that it is bad. <laughs> right? <laughs> and we're so focused on it that we're not seeing anything else. But he is ta he was talking recently. I, I only just started his episode on Joe Rogan that just came out, I think, like last week, maybe. And he was talking about one of the things, and I think he said it started in 1993, unless it is organic. Everything else, every other grain grown in the United States is coated in folic acid. And folic acid doesn't exist naturally. It's a man-made derivative of folate. Mm -hmm. which does exist naturally everywhere on the planet or all over the planet. And so, but folic acid, what, what he's finding in research is that roughly, I don't know, 40 some percent of the human population in the United States has a genetic variant that we can't process folic acid. We're not breaking it down. So like every, everything that we put in our mouths we have to, our body has to transmute it and it, it, it doesn't get utilized the way it enters our body. We have to break it down and we can't break down like so, so much of the population can't break down folic acid into its usable form. So it just like stagnates and it builds up and builds up and builds up and it's causing what they think. They think it's causing anxiety and depression and ADHD and all uh, moods, like all this stuff, we can't function because we're, we have these like excess folic acid in our bodies. Because of course, what are we doing? We're starting the, the average American diet. We're starting with cereals or pop tarts or bread or some sort of grain that is enriched or fortified, which means it has folic acid sprayed on it. So I'm wondering, like now my mind is going like, is this also happening in our dog? Cause I, I think I saw in your bio that you have some 
uh, or you were a certified dog trainer and I was a dog trainer for a little while as well. And I literally would change the dog's diets and put myself out of a job, which was the best thing in the world. So Mm -hmm. I'm like, if we're, if, if, and to me, I'm like, we're taking the, I'm taking the grains out of this dog's diet and their behavior is radically changing. Is it just the grains or is it the folic acid on the grain? I don't know. I don't know. Like, I mean, that's definitely something that they tend to over supplement too, even if it doesn't have the grains. It's really interesting. Um, So, you know, we rely on, we don't spray a bunch of vitamins and minerals in our food. We, We use a little bit of zinc to make up that deficit between where we are and naturally with AFCO. And that's, it's really not that much. Um, but everything is naturally occurring in our formulas. And when you do these laboratory panels, these like AFCO tests to you kind know, of sort of check the completeness and balancedness of your formulas, um, a lot of labs, they don't, ha- they test for folic acid. They don't even test for folate. So we, you know, basically, we basically gotten almost like zero and we had to send it and we found out this is what happened. So we had to send to a different lab just to get our, our folate numbers because the lab that's our primary lab doesn't even test for folate. Wow. I mean, that's amazing to me. Like that's what, if we're actually feeding real food, but that's, I think that's another like example of why, and I, this, this, this idea is, I think, just starting to get rolling in the healthy pet food world of the reality that AFCO standards, like fresh food can't meet AFCO standards because AFCO standards are based on throwing this premix pack. Yeah, in, I mean, they're right? not, fresh, AFCO standards are not geared towards fresh food. Um, but right. the reality is, is, and I don't think people understand this, even though AFCO is a non-regulatory body. They set the recommendations that states set as their policies, right? So even though AFCO is not going around, and I think a lot of people don't understand this because they're like, oh, well, why don't you just do AFCO? Because they don't enforce anything. It's not, it's not that simple. We have to, unfortunately, play by the same rules as everyone else, as these much bigger companies that are just like pumping out garbage. So... <laughs> It's, we shouldn't have to follow the same rules because I think there, there is a fundamental difference in fresh food and something that's overly processed. But it's just we we have to hit the same numbers and it's unfortunate. But the beautiful thing is, is you can do it with food. You can do it. You know, you really can. I remember when we were first kind of reformulating Evermore, when we first started the company, we were very lucky in that we got to consult with someone who. She worked with Big Pat. She was very, very, very like well regarded. I can't say who it is. But, you know, when we we showed her, we basically, you know, told her what we were doing. And she's, you know, we were were getting consultation on the supplement blend. She's like, oh, well, you're going to need this, this, you're going to need supplement iron, you're going to need this vitamin, that vitamin, you know, it was like a laundry list. And hold up, let's just let's just test the recipes and see where we're at before we add a bunch of stuff. So we did our tests. And we did need a couple of things back then, um, but we showed her where we were and she's like, oh, well, I guess it's theoretically possible to hit those numbers with food. It was like shocking to her. And we're one of the, I really think that we were probably the first company that, you know, we were one of, we were one of the first fresh cook companies, but I think we were the first company that really was, you know, dedicated to doing this food-based nutritional approach. Like I can't think of anyone else that was doing that where really we tried to hit everything with food. Um, follow up to that. And goes back to our first thing. So originally, we we did have to supplement with a little bit more than we are now. Um, And one of the things that we supplemented with in our poultry recipes was choline. And when we switched from certified humane, cage-free eggs, right? When we switched from that to fully pastured, we retested everything. And we did not need to supplement with choline. It made that much of a difference in our nutritional numbers. So back to that point that ingredient quality matters. Yeah, it really does. And even like, you know, people that are doing like DIY raw feeding or even DIY home cooking, a lot of a lot of the raw feeders, I would say, are not so obsessed with every meal has to be balanced, right? We can balance over time. Because we're just doing this 
ourselves in our home and our veterinarians hate us for it. (laughs) Right? Honestly, most of our customers, veterinarians hate them too, just for even feeding your fresh food. So I can't imagine how much it is, how much worse it is for like DIY raw. It's insane. Like in your food, it, it, it meets the standards that a veterinarian has has in their head that says, you know, this is this is why you're supposed to feed this bag of kibble is because it it meets all of the dietary needs, blah, blah, blah. And then a fresh food comes along and does the same thing. And they're like, no. <laughs> well, okay. you can't trust it. It's a small company. They don't. They, how do they know that they're doing it? It's like, I guarantee you, we do more finished product testing than like than big kibble. Yeah. We, well, we test every I mean. Batch. Yeah, I think I think that's evidenced by by all the recalls, right? Like we we can we have proof that that they're not testing their process. No. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I mean, we do we do a full mineral panel on every um, on every run that we do because there is natural variation. Right. So we do need to know if there's anything, anything wonky happening. And we do you know, we add eggshell powder for calcium and we do supplement with a little bit of zinc. So it's really important for us to, you know, dot our I's and cross our T's. And this is this thing that we're adding that is the amount of calcium is like critically important. And we trust our kitchen completely. But mistakes happen. So if we're testing those things we can say okay this this is exactly how it's supposed to be so and that's interesting too that evermore was one of the first or the first um you know gently cooked that that balanced at least mostly with with whole foods because there even today there aren't that many there are a handful and between raw and cooked and it, I mean, you can count you you can count them here, right? Yeah, I um, mean, it's really it's difficult. It is it is not an easy thing to pull off, especially you know a lot of. So I I think I feel like the cooked foods now are like falling into two classes of food, right? There are the ones that are just kind of like a raw food but cooked, you know, and those are actually easier to balance um, because they're kind of they are a little meat heavier. Ours is more of kind of a more traditional um, cooked diet. And believe me, we're not slouching on the meat. It's like 65%. But we do have more produce ingredients, you know, than these than these more like ancestral style diets. And I could go into so much detail about like when one is more appropriate than the other. But, but those are harder to balance. Uh, so it is really, it is not an easy task just in terms of figuring it not just figuring it out right there are spreadsheets i can figure out but like yeah like sourcing it and just getting everything getting everything right like it's not easy most companies are not going to want to pay for like the breadth of ingredients that you really need to do it correctly Mm -hmm. well and and i appreciate that there are a handful of companies that are doing it and that you're doing it differently because again, like we were talking about, there are there are reasons why you might want to feed your dog one thing over another. And so my dog, she has been I've only fed her commercial raw since I adopted her, and I've been regularly testing her gut bi- gut microbiome. She needs more fiber, and so I've been adding more. Feeding her the same thing, but adding more veg- vegetable to it. And it has helped. So if a dog is in that situation, it, it, you know, switching to a food that does have a higher vegetable content could very well be beneficial if that's your goal. If your goal is to get to a balanced microbiome, I don't know how possible or sustainable <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it, it it is. I don't know. I mean, we're just just like with us. Like we don't eat a balanced diet every single day. And uh, I would no, probably, <laughs> I mean, no, I would probably be mortified if I tested my gut microbiome. Oh, there's no way I'm testing my gut biome. No way. I mean, look, I I really care about quality, but yeah, I don't want to think. I, my dog definitely ate way, way, way better than I did. Um, but yeah, I know that fiber can be really important or, you know, sometimes with the meat or have meat, heavier meat diets, like one thing that we see a lot of is something like acid reflux, right? And 
the meat, whether you cook that meat or serve it raw, there's going to be the same amount of acidity there, right? Or there's other things or fat. If you have more meat, right, that's going to be a fattier diet, no matter what, like just in terms of, you know, meat is protein and fat. So sometimes you need to cut that down depending on the dog's needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it is interesting, again, to talk, I mean, just talking about feeding the dog in front of you. And that's, that's my biggest thing is feed, feed the dog in front of you or feed the cat in front of you because my dog may do really well on a high fat diet. Whereas my neighbor's dog might not do as well on a high fat diet because I mean, people, humans, we've been taught that, you know, fat is horrible and um, salt is horrible and, you know, all these things like eggs and cholesterol are horrible for you. Like they want us to believe, (laughs) right? Yeah. No, eggs are wonderful. By the way, eggs are bad. (laughs) <laughs> please keep eating red meat and and, and yeah. put some butter on that steak, please. Like, like you know. We, but we've like demonized fat, and we've de- we've demonized so many things that are actually really healthy for us if we eat them appropriately. Healthy fats are wonderful for us, but um, yeah, it's it's all about feeding the animal in front of you, in my opinion. Which is why I'd like to have like a wide array of recommendations for people. (laughs) Oh, yeah. And most of our customers, I think that the ones who do the best by their dogs actually feed rotationally, right? Whether Mm -hmm. it's rotational with their home cook, rotational with different brands, rotational with like cooked and raw. I think it's really, you know, there are times in dogs' lives or cases where there does need to be a narrow focus on something that specifically supports them because they are going through something. They do have a condition. They are targeting, you know, certain nutrient profiles, but the way to guarantee the most healthy dog possible is to feed them as much variety as possible from as young of an age as possible. And I think that that's true for us too. Yes, absolutely. I I do try to do that with, with my dog. I, I feed different brands. I do feed different proteins, different proteins from different brands and, um, the one thing that I don't rotate anymore after I talked to Billy Hookman, I don't rotate goat's milk anymore. I used to rotate brands of goat's milk, but he convinced me that there's enough rotation in their <laughs> goat's milk. Naturally occurring rotation. So I just, I, I don't, I don't rotate that anymore, but um, I, pretty much everything else I do rotate. I rotate, I like, I pull supplements. Um, it It's just, Again, it's all it's all about individuality. So I'm glad you, you brought that up as well. So what are um I'm looking over here at this this little <laughs> this little pamphlet. Little which is actually like totally due for a redesign and we've been working on it, but it's on the back burner. That brochure is like I can't even Oh it's so cute. Everybody like, isn't it cute? It is. Everybody loves how colorful it is. I like how colorful it is. It like really cool. stands out. How we won't lose the is. color. Don't worry. That's one okay. thing. That's one thing. Even if we redesign it, it's more just to keep in, you know, in tune with, you know, like we don't have our pastured chicken in there. We don't have our vendor logos in there. So got to update it. So what are the um, formulas that are currently available? So we currently have chicken and beef, and those are our old school day one grain inclusive formulas, you know, with that little bit of oat and barley. And then our grain-free formulas are our turkey and our lamb. Okay. Awesome. And, the, and that's do it for they now. all have eggs? Yeah, do they all have egg in they them? They all have eggs. Yeah, no, they all, so they actually have fairly consistent supporting ingredients between them. Um, the chicken and the beef have, um, have kind of the same supporting ingredients and then the turkey and the lamb do. And the re- rationale for that is for like very easy rotation. So keep the proteins, you know, keep the proteins different, but then have, you know, the other supporting ingredients the same. Also, it's a sourcing thing. Uh, But we are, we are looking to broaden our line. Right now we're working on cat food. We're going to bring in a puppy food. And then we have some really exciting ideas for other stuff, but that's under wraps at the moment. The thing Um, is with being a very small company, you know, it does take, it does take longer, I think, than than companies with more resources to get to get new products out there. Oh, of course, of course. And so, if 
someone wanted to try the food, um, is it all direct to consumer sales? We do have some retailers. Um, we actually started off as a retail brand, but it was um, we didn't have a large enough team to support what it takes to keep stuff in retail. And honestly, the margins are just not great. So you, yeah. you definitely need a little bit more behind you to succeed um, in a retail situation. That said, we do have independent retailers scattered in a few different places that really believe in our products. And we will always, always work with retailers if they want to work with us, we just ship direct to retail. We don't have a distributor, but 95% of our business is direct to consumer. Uh, so people that want to try Evermore can go on our website. Um, and we have samplers, you know, where people can get smaller amounts of the food to try with, you know, to try it before they commit to a larger amount. Um, and then we offer, actually, we just changed our website. So it's like fully customizable. You can get any amount of food over eight pounds and just decide like, okay, I want like six lamb and 12 turkey, whatever. You can just pick whatever combination you want and get it. And you can do it as a one-time order, or you can get it on a subscription basis. We don't want to lock anyone into subscriptions if that's not, you know, if that's not something they want to do. Okay, cool. So one more question for you is about the cooking process because it's sous vide. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. Now, not, I would imagine, like, I feel like my husband reminds me of this all the time that people don't know what I know. Cause I'm like, I know what sous vide <laughs> is, but what is sous vide? <laughs> okay. Sous vide is it's French for under vacuum. And so basically what happens is in, in it's, it's much, it's a much different process on like a not commercial scale, but the general concept is the same. Basically, the food is put in vacuum sealed pouches, right? So all the air is sucked out. Then it's cooked at a lower temperature than you normally would, um, you know, that you normally quickly cook something. We cook till our food hits um, 165 and it's done in steam ovens, right? So it's, um, it's not like boiled or anything. It's just like steam to temperature. And that's the under the vacuum part is really what makes it sous vide, right? If you're doing it in like a home situation, it's like you've got these like baths that you're submerging the food in. Um, but the really the important thing about this process is one, we can maintain a lower temperature. Two, because there's no oxygen coming in, you know, it like reduces oxidation, it maintains the flavor, it maintains the nutrients. So that's why that's why it's a really great process. As opposed to a lot of other foods, you'll see they're doing something like kettle cooking, where it's like these big open kettles, which we used to do before we moved to sous vide. But I really do think we saw an improvement in kind of the flavor of the food, the smell, the texture. Uh, so yeah, it's 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 different from from most of what you'll see out there. Okay, yeah, because I I actually had tried two other cooked food recipes. Um, to be fair, not that it, it really would matter. I bought the cat versions of them because I wanted to transition my cats. Like an idiot. Let <laughs> how that's that, how'd that work out for how'd it work mm. out for cats? <laughs> cats are tough. Cats are really tough. Oh my goodness. Let me tell you. And two of them are 14, two of them are 15. And um, I mean I I do the best I can with them. That's that's cats are tough. <laughs> they are. I actually have one cat that will eat like a raw fr a frozen raw. I'll thaw it out and he'll, he'll eat that. And then two of my other cats will eat freeze-dried raw, which uh, thank you so much for picking the most expensive food there is, right? But they're cats. Anyway, <laughs> cats. Um, so, so I got the, the, but my, my dog has never had a problem eating cat, never had a problem eating cat food. But um, yeah, these two companies, my, my dog would not touch it. Of course, my cats wouldn't touch it. I'm like, okay, okay fine. But then my dog wouldn't touch it either. And I'm like, really? Really? So I was, I was pleasantly surprised when she, like, she dug in to the Evermore beef recipe and, like, came back to her plate. Like, is there more? <laughs> um, so I was Evermore. very pleasantly surprised with that. <laughs> well, I'm not. We, we, as, we, as we like to say when people's dogs eat our food and they're, you know, they're, they hate it. I'm like, well, we're delighted but not surprised. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, look, my dog, I, I would not say I have a picky dog by any means, but she also, I've also tried multiple freeze dried raws with her and there's only one 
that she will eat that I have found. So it's like I haven't tried a raw food that she wouldn't eat. Even if I DIY raw, which I have only done once because I that is not I'm just not in that season of life. Um, she would she'll eat it. So I have not tried a raw that she wouldn't eat. So it was like when I bought freeze dried raw and rehydrated it, I've tried it both ways, like not just giving it to her to see if she was she would smell it, be interested in it, like treats, you know, and then um rehydrating it. And I multiple brands she was like nope not 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 eating that and they so there's one brand of freeze-dried that she'll eat and then and now one brand of cooked that she'll eat (laughs) well we're happy to be the few the proud (laughs) yeah she's not she's not picky she's just discerning she she is very discerning (laughs) yeah (laughs) so i like yeah and it, it very well could be that um sous vide process that versus you know this big batch cooking that yeah, that it could just be other a flavor cooking. like a flavor thing mm-hmm. it very well could be it because i know i mean when we sous vide at home is just what you said it's you know the big water bath and the so like i get it i i understand the process but understanding the commercialization of the process is also important and the steam versus the boiling and-, yeah. and I mean, I think there are commercial, you know, there are commercial places that do it in the baths as well. It's just, you know, it depends on, depends on the facility, but it, it is a time the, the baths take a really long time. And, you know, when you are making a lot of something, it's really yes. the vacuum part of the process. It's the most important part of the process. Oh, and while, while we're at it, um, I might as well have disclaimer pouches, right? So it does happen. It is a process that involves plastic, which I, this is like the one part of our product that I that I don't like from an environmental standpoint. We do everything else we can. Um, one day, hopefully, there will be a material that will probably be made from mushrooms because every <laughs> mushrooms are are like really the thing that's going to save the world. Um, but you know, people ask all the time, like, is there BPA? Is there this? Is there that? So I do want to say we test everything. We're so diligent. We did independent testing on the pouches that we have. Sorry, my cat just jumped off this table. Um, and they are free from BPA. They're free from phthalates and other plasticizers that no- are known to like cause estrogenic activity. And they are like FDA approved for human consumption, you know, for, for human applications. So just want to get that out of the way. Um, that no, is I appreciate the- it because it, it is hard. And it, I mean, it can be hard to bring up too because the reality is like, is there a company that's not using plastic? You know, I, I do my best to keep plastics out of my kitchen and for the most part I'm successful, but I mean, pretty much everything I buy is in plastic. It's just like the reality of the world we live in. And then those alternate materials, like there is stuff, you know, made from cellulose, made from other stuff. And the reality is, is it doesn't hold up that well with heat applications and then freezing. It just doesn't. It's going to shorten your shelf life. And I I mean, I really, we've consulted with experts on this. There is no non-plastic material that can withstand the applications that we're doing, uh, which I'm I'm just like hoping science catches up really quickly. Yes, me too. Me too. (laughs) It is important, but, but having, I mean, that's impressive that you're doing the, the testing on it. Um, because I would imagine most companies aren't, especially small companies. I mean, that's got to be expensive to do, right? Yeah. And you know, it's like it's an epic responsibility putting putting food out in the world, feeding people's. I mean, they're our family, right? And we see this. You know, your dog isn't a dollar sign. It's it's a part of your life. It's your family. I mean, my dog felt. I mean, she's she was my soulmate, right? I get it. Um, so we see this responsibility is so important that. We're not going to put something out there that we're not a hundred percent sure about. We we test everything. We really, I mean, again, this is just a huge responsibility, so we take it seriously. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being so open and honest about everything. I, I mean, I appreciate it personally, and I, when I'm doing the podcast and when I'm putting content out into the world, like I want to put information out there that. I would want to know about and hopefully it's other important. people want to know it too. <laughs> so I appreciate it very, very much. Um, where can people learn more? Is it, uh, you know, socials and I've got it here. So evermore, 
um, Evermore Pet Food everywhere. And then evermorepetfood.com. Correct. Evermorepetfood.com. Yes. Um, I will say, like, we have the Twitter or I guess X right now. X. We don't use it. Um, we don't use it. We don't really use threads. <laughs> if you really, if you want to find us honestly and engage with us, you know, I think Instagram is our main, our main jam. Um, we're, we're on the Facebook, but I would say Instagram is really we, where we hang out the most. We have a TikTok account that we don't use. So. I get it. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard being There's everywhere. So and There's then so much. I know. And then like, I don't, I don't do X either. Like I, I tried for a little while, but it's like you you have to be on the platform to be on the platform. And it's so there's so much negativity and it's all bad news. And I'm like, I don't want to be there. I don't want to see this. I don't want to hear this. <laughs> Seriously. And you know, I Morgan, our socials person who who you met, who's wonderful, yes. she's like, Yeah, you gotta know where your customers are and it's better to do one thing well yes. than to spread yourself too thin trying to do a million things. So yes. that's kind of where we are. We're, we're, we're doing the Instagram and by extension, the Facebook. Yes, that same here. So appreciate it. <laughs> Guys, go follow Evermore Pet Food. If you want to check them out, evermorepetfood.com. And I will have all of that linked in the show notes for you. Again, Hannah, thank you so much for being here and for everything that you're doing for our pets. Thank you so much for having me. It's really, really fun chatting with you. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos and my online dog training the Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Oh, 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 oh.